I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I am so glad you have chosen to come to this house of the Lord. And I do pray that this will be a meaningful worship experience for each one of you. We have beautiful flowers on both sides of the altar this morning. And they are given to the glory of God in honor of Patrick and Elizabeth McKinrick and Chris and Ellie Atan. And they're having babies. By the way, in case you didn't know, there are tables down in the fellowship hall. I think Patrick and Elizabeth are going to have a little girl. And I don't, in the newsletter, uh, Chris and Ellie are having a surprise. <laughs> I don't know, is it still a surprise? Oh, there is. Hey, Patrick. Hey, hi, Teresa. Oh, I'm really excited. Yeah, but they're sitting in the back in case they want to escape, I guess. I don't know. Patrick, I want to see your beard. Pull that down a minute. Okay, never mind. You just imagine. I can only imagine. Well, congratulations. And something that is new. And I decided our church is small enough I can get away with doing this. We shouldn't have dozens of birthdays every week. So every week I will mention those who are having a birthday. And Everett Weber is having a birthday today. How old is he? Five years old. Oh, let's go celebrate with him. Yeah, why stay here? Now, Jim Menifee, his birthday is on Friday. He's a little older, I think, than Everett is. Normal things happening. We make mats for the homeless on Monday at 3, and intercessory prayer here in the sanctuary at 11 o'clock on Wednesday. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Good having Ace back. Good seeing you. Let us worship God.
Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Let us pray. Almighty God, we offer our lives to you in worship. If we're suffering, we come to you in prayer. If we're happy, we gather to sing songs of praise to you. Our response to all the circumstances of our lives is to lift it all to you in praise and prayer. Meet us here to comfort our hurting hearts and to hear our songs of praise, lifted through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us stand and sing hymn number 82, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. be seated while the children come forward for their special time. Hey, Becky. How are you doing? Well, we got Patricia and Paula children right here with you, so, <laughs> so you're okay. This morning, I'm going to talk to you about something I know you do, prayer. Now, way back when I was in college, I took an English class. Actually, I took several. But in one of those classes, it talked about journalism. And if you wanted to write an article for a paper and to make sure you got everything in there that needed to be included, you asked yourself five questions. You had to answer these five questions in the article. Who, what, where, when, and why. So... Let's think about those questions in relation to prayer. The first one, who? Who should pray? Just members of this church? Just Presbyterians? How about Methodists? Should they pray? We pray for them. I think I know you well enough I can get away with that. You won't see the back pew here next week. There. They will leave. How about Rome? Well, then that will be here. How about Roman Catholics? Yeah, well, I can't find your mom. Oh, there she is. Yeah, I think, yeah, 
they pray to? Well, the answer is what? Everybody. Who should pray? Everybody should pray. Anybody should pray. What we sh should we pray about? What should we pray for? Uh, if we're suffering, if we're in pain, if we're feeling bad, should we pray? How about if we're happy, if everything's going great, the sun is shining, and hopefully it's going to do that soon? Should we pray when we're happy? Well, okay, what would you pray about? We can pray about anything we want. Where should we pray? Just in church? Uh, just at home? Uh, don't know, huh? Well, I'll give you the answer. Anywhere. You can, and I do this, and it can apply to a lot of these. I do what, what people call popcorn prayers. I pray all the time. I pray when I get up in the morning. I pray when I'm walking the dog. I pray she doesn't break my leg. I pray when I'm driving the car. I don't close my eyes. But I pray. Sometimes they're really brief most of the time. I'll think of something that I'm so grateful for, and I'll just say thank you. And sometimes I'll just say thank you, thank you, thank you. And then sometimes when bad things are happening, I'll just go help. Or help me, help me, help me. But I pray anywhere. And you can pray anywhere. So when? Anywhere. Okay, when? Anytime. Just, okay, when do we pray? Mealtime. You pray mealtime? Yeah. How about in church? We, yeah, when? When you're in church, that's a good place to pray. I'm a lot more formal in my prayers in church. I actually write those things out. That's the only time I do that. When, any, any time you want to. Why? Why should we pray? Well, okay, think about what prayer is. Prayer is talking to God. And hopefully it's a conversation. It's not just talking. We're also listening to what God wants to communicate to us. But why do you talk to anybody? Why do you talk to your family? Because you want to share your life with them. Because you love them. You want to let them know about your day, what's going on. And so that's why we go to God, because we love him. We just want to talk to him about our day, what's going on, what's going wrong, what's going right, just all the moments. But also because it changes things. And when we pray, sometimes it changes the situation. I think more often than not, it changes us and how we think about that situation. But that is what I believe, why we go to God in prayer. So who, anyone, we can pray about anything, anywhere, at any time, because God answers prayer. So let's go talk to God right now. If you want, you want to stand, Becky? I'll get you to pray with me. Our Father, we thank you that we can go to you at all times and in all places to share our lives with you. Hear us as we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being here. Let us stand and sing hymn number 162, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. <laughs>
be seated. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Let us worship now with the giving of our gifts to God. Most merciful and gracious God, give us the courage and the energy to do the right thing for the right reasons at the right time. You have given us the opportunity at this time and in this place to bless those in this family of believers. Take what we place before you and use it to produce a rich harvest for your glory. In the name of Jesus, we lift our offering and our prayer. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the Sermon on the Mount. And this immediately precedes the Lord's Prayer, which we will pray together in just a few minutes. But verses 5 through 8, so I invite you to listen. Listen for the word of God to you. Jesus said, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Friends, this is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And let us once again go to God in prayer. And I'll remind you of the prayer concerns printed on the back of the bulletin. We have several that are new and several that are not printed. Uh, We ask that you lift up and pray for each one of them. Frank Bullard III, uh, Becky Bullard's nephew, uh, is in the hospital. 
Steve Collins, a friend of Mary Rhodes, has a staph infection in his leg. Um, this is, in the way she put it, and I'm looking for her, uh, in his good leg, his other leg was amputated. So we please lift him up, pray for him. Uh, Stacy Jones uh, had hip replacement on the 21st. Greg Smith had back surgery on the 23rd. Those that you do not have, uh, Steve Holtzclaw, uh, brother-in-law of Tina Silva, is in the hospital with uh, multiple health issues, so please lift him up. Paula Shelton told me that Vernon Sansom is back in the hospital, uh, again with, with his heart, and so they're trying to determine exactly whether they need to put in, what was it, a pacemaker or medication to help control it. But So please pray for Vernon. He's a former pastor of this church, by the way, uh, for those of you who don't know him. Uh, got a call from Meg Schreiber. Her grandniece, Hannah Thorson, is hiking the entire West Coast. She's an RN. I think she's taking a break from all of the pressure that she has been under. And so Meg wants us to pray for her and traveling mercies. And we found out that uh, the sister of Peggy Googe, one of her two sisters, died, Gina Ralston, on Friday, April the 23rd. So please lift up and pray for Peggy and her family. Oh my goodness! I am so excited. I'm surprised I didn't see you before. Perry and Peggy, this is the first time they've been back in a year. And we have, in, in, oh. You are welcome. Well, and John and Kim are here for the first time. They've been fully vaccinated, so you don't have to worry about getting too close to them. Although I try to stay as far away from John as I can. <laughs> but other than that, but there are several others. Last time, Tina and Bob were here for the first time. And I've got to be careful. I start naming names. I'm going to get in trouble and miss some people. But we're excited to see uh, some of those who were so regular before Teresa uh, coming back. And, of course, it's always good to see Patrick. I've heard about his beard, but he won't let me see it. So, yeah, I'll cover it back up. No, it looks wonderful. You're a handsome guy with or without the beard, so you're good. If there is anyone that you would like to let us know about, to remember in prayer, you're invited to say their name out loud. Uh, as we first go to God silently in prayer, and then I will lead in the pastoral prayer. Let us go to God. Loving God in humility, we come to you in prayer. You have blessed us in the past and, and you guide us into the future. There has never been a time when you have not been with us. It's easy to remember and honor and pray to you in times of crisis, during seasons of suffering, everything, absolutely everything is important and significant. Life itself is on the line. No word is casual, no action meaningless. And almost always, a relationship with you is at the very center of our lives. We can't wait to worship you. We can't wait to lift our lives in prayer before you. We can't wait to sing praises to you. But during the mundane moments of our lives, when things are dull and routine and boring, it's easy for us to crowd you out of our lives. We focus primarily on ourselves and, and treat worship as a hobby and prayer well, as a convenience, and sometimes we completely disregard what you have to say to us. Wake us up. Help us to live our lives aware of and grateful for your presence. 
Help us to pray continually and to be continually receptive to your will for our lives. This is our prayer through the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. strength, my song, this cornerstone, my solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter.
What is the biggest motivator for prayer? I can answer that question in two words. Answered prayer. Can you think about those moments in your life when you prayed and you prayed and you prayed for something and it came to pass? It was answered. Maybe it's a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter. And you keep praying and praying, not for weeks or months, but for years for them to come back. And then after all that time, they do. They come back home. They come back to the Lord. They come back to church. And you're rejoicing. Your prayers have been answered. Or maybe someone you love goes into the hospital. Maybe it's COVID-19. It is serious. They're on a ventilator. You don't know if they're going to live or die. So you pray. And you pray for weeks and weeks that they'll be delivered from this disease. And then they recover and they get out of the hospital and you are elated. Your prayers have been answered. Tremendous motivator for prayer. What is the biggest demotivator for prayer? I can answer that in two words. Unanswered prayer. Somebody wants to get married and they want it desperately and they have prayed not just for weeks or months, for years to be led to the right person or for the right person to be led to them. And it never happens. And they are absolutely crushed. Or someone is experiencing deep, dark depression and they keep praying and praying for weeks and months for this feeling to be lifted from them but the feeling is never lifted and they're wondering if it will ever go away or someone was cheated in business and they just want justice to be served but justice just doesn't seem to be served Unanswered prayer can not only cripple your prayer life, it can cripple your spiritual life. So let's look for just a few minutes at the ache and the agony of unanswered prayer. And the outline for this sermon, the outline is taken from a book, Too Busy Not to Pray by Bill Hybels. And one of the reasons for the ache and the agony is sometimes God says no. It is not going to happen. And that is one response we just don't want to hear. But the Bible is not naive about God saying no to request to desires for what God's people wants. Do you know what each one of these individuals have in common? They all prayed for the same thing, for different reasons, but for the same thing. Moses, Jeremiah, Elijah, and Jonah. Do you know what they prayed for? To die. For their name just to be written out of the book of life. Just to be lifted out of this life and into the next. Have you ever prayed that prayer rhetorical? Do not answer that. I have. I prayed that prayer. You know, be just fine with me, Lord. If you just take me on, I'm I'm good. I am ready to to go. I really don't want to put up with what I've got to put up with. But in each one of those cases, God said, no, that's not how the kingdom works. There is a better day coming. You you can't see it now. I can see it. You don't know it. I also have something more for you to do. Yes, it's a better day. Will it be easy? No. Will you have to sacrifice for it? Yes. But a better day is coming. I have something I want you to do. Do you remember the time when Peter, James, and John went up on a mountain with Jesus? We call it the Mount of Transfiguration because Jesus was transfigured. He was glowing. And then they saw Peter, James, and John, two other people who had died years before, up there on the mountain with Jesus, Moses and Elijah. And Peter was stumbling and stammering and trying to make sense of it. And he said, well, let's just make three shelters up here. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Let's just stay up here forever. 
And Jesus said, no, that's not how the kingdom works. Yeah, mountaintop experiences are wonderful. Wouldn't you just love to stay up there where everything is wonderful and glowing and bright? That's not reality. That's not life. He said, we need to go down. There's work to be done. I have something for us to do down in the valley, a ministry for all of you to perform. Will it be easy? No, it'll be difficult, but the reward is great. There was a time when James and John wanted to climb the career ladder in a sense. They wanted to get better seats at the table. You remember this? And they had their mom went to Jesus, knelt down before him and said, Jesus, I want you to put one son on your left hand, one son on your right hand when you come into your kingdom. Okay? And Jesus looked at this kneeling woman and said, no, that's not how the kingdom works. And there was a time when the disciples went into Samaria and they were not welcomed very well. Uh, As a matter of fact, they were rejected. And you have to remember there was this, a lot of animosity between the Israelites and the Samaritans. You remember that. So James and John said, okay, Lord, do you want us to rain down fire from heaven on them? Just wipe them out. And Jesus said, no. That's not the way the kingdom works. And remember at another time, not this time, he said, love your enemies? Well, that's a rough one. I wish he kind of hadn't said that. It's really hard to come across in our lives, isn't it? But have you ever prayed that prayer? Have you ever wanted a better seat at the table? Have you ever wanted to just, Lord, would you just take them out? Would you just wipe them out? I mean, nothing terrible or dramatic, but just do something. Have you prayed that prayer? It's not how the kingdom works. And we'll all remember this time in the life of Paul where he makes this statement. He says, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. And we don't know what that thorn was, but evidently he didn't like it too much. And so he asked for it to be removed. And what did God say to him? No. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. And three times he said, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Well, I've prayed that prayer. Actually, I've been praying that prayer for the last two and a half years. I've got a thorn in the flesh. And... I wanted God just kind of magically take it away. Well, guess what? He didn't magically take it away. So in about three weeks, I'm going to have surgery, and you'll have Carlton preaching to you, and I'll talk to you more about that another time. But my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness, and, well, I'm feeling pretty powerless. This is the one, I think, that strikes me the most, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane before he's betrayed, before he is arrested, and, and we know what happens next. It is so painful um, what they did to him. And so he prays this agonizing prayer. He says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet, not my will, but yours be done. How often have we prayed that prayer? You know, there are certain things that are about to happen. I don't want it to happen. Will you just kind of have it not happen? And for some reason, he says, no, it's going to happen. But that had to happen, didn't it? Our salvation depended on that happening, which brings us to the second point. Sometimes, oh, well, I'm not going to get to that second point yet. Sometimes, do you remember this song by Garth Brooks? Everybody, it's kind of a teary song, isn't it? Sometimes God's greatest gift around that. And the song is based on a true story of going back to a high school. I think it was a football game and seeing this girl that he was years and years ago was in love with and wanted to marry, but she wouldn't marry him. And now years later, he looks and goes, well, I thank God for unanswered prayers. He is grateful for what he has. And sometimes we're grateful For God's unanswered prayer of God saying no to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane because our salvation did 
hang in the balance. And there are other things. God can see things down the line that we can't see. And he says, no, this will end up hurting you and not helping someone else. And we trust God with that. Or we're asked to trust God with it. What's the number one wrong request? The number one thing you shouldn't ask God for. Now this is from Bill Hybels. I'm not sure I agree with this. So I'm going to throw it out and you can tell me whether you agree with it. He says the number one wrong request is God change them. And he does that in relation to marriage. God, would you just change my husband? Would you just change my wife to be more like what I want them to be? Doesn't that remind you of this book by John Ortberg that some of you have been studying? I'd like you more if you were more like me. And the reason he says it's a number one wrong request, and I think you probably realize this, it's a very immature, selfish prayer. I want you to make them so they can make me happy, so they can make me feel better. Instead of praying, make, change me. What is there inside me where I can appreciate them as they are, the way they are, to love them the way they are? Now, I'm not sure that's the number one wrong request, but I do know it's not a worthy prayer. Change them. Although, no, I'll just stop there. Uh, <laughs> that, that's not a good one. Okay, sometimes he says, wait. And I think this happens most of the time, or it seems like it does in my life anyway. And there is a, and this is not a no, you can't have it, or no, it is wrong. And by the way, I do believe you can pray for anything, and there's nothing off limits, but God will tell you if you, and I'll read this in a minute, if it's a wrong motive, if it's something you shouldn't be praying for, God will let you know that, but you can lift anything up. But this is not a no, it's a not yet. Okay, Examples of this are all over the Bible, all over the Old Testament. Abraham had to wait years for a child, for that which he was promised. He had to wait decades, and he was 99 years old and way too old to have kids when Isaac happened. Israel had to wait how many years before they got into the promised land? Forty. They could have done it in one. They were there, and there's a reason for that. So they could be prepared to actually do what they would need to do once they got into it, into the land of promise, Canaan. Joseph had this dream, didn't he? He had dreams of being a ruler and his family would bow down to him. And what happened? Well, his brothers didn't like that too much, which is understandable. But what they did, they threw him in a pit, sold him into slavery. He was falsely accused, thrown into prison. It was years. It was two years after he interpreted the dream of the cupbearer before he could even get out of prison. Sometimes we're just asked to wait. I love this passage of Scripture. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, which is what I think God was doing with the Israelites in the wilderness. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. One of the things we need to develop in our lives, a character quality that many people lack, is patience. We live in an instant gratification society. There's a Stanford study that said one of the primary frustrations in people's lives today is a computer not coming on quickly enough. Go, that's it? That's your greatest? I can list you a whole lot of other frustrations, but I have that one. Here we are. We have access to more information instantly than at any time in the history of humanity. And we get upset and we have to wait two minutes for the computer to come on. I had that moment two weeks ago. Mike, have you had this? It comes on and it some, says something like checking for updates. This may take a few minutes. I waited an hour. That little circle thing is circling. What is that called? It kept going. I'm getting tired of looking at this. I get up. I walk around the church. I go pray. God, make my computer come on. He said, wait, it's not going to happen. After two hours, I got so frustrated. 
I tried, I unplugged the computer, I turned it off. I thought, if I restart it, isn't that what you always do? If you, I, see, it wouldn't let me restart it because nothing shows up, just a little circly thing. And so I unplug it. I crashed my computer. It, it was, it, it, okay, a thing would come up, but nothing would happen. Now, fortunately, <laughs> my son is an IT person. He can remotely get in to my computer. So Will got onto my computer. That poor boy was in there for four hours <laughs> trying to fix and find what I had let go away. He found it in the cloud, whatever that is. I, it's up in heaven, I guess. I'm not <laughs> sure where that stuff's stored. But he went to heaven and he got all this information and got it back in my computer. It, two days later, it happened again. I didn't touch it. Did not touch the computer. I waited. Fortunately, this time it was about 15 minutes. Well, and they say they, people say one of the greatest qualities you can instill in your children is patience. Uh, third, second, third Peter. Second Peter 3, 8 and 9 but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. God's concept of time and hours are just two completely different things. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. In human terms, it seems slow to us, but God is working while we're waiting. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Okay, what is he waiting for? What is he working for while we're waiting? He is trying to do something which is trying to get us to mature. Sometimes he wants us to grow, to develop a closer relationship with him, maybe a closer relationship with other people. And so he says, okay, I want you to wait. Okay, what is it? Now, here's a list of things. And all of these can be considered prayer blockers. Keeps us from receiving what God is trying to communicate to us. But some of the things he wants us to work on in our lives. And one is an inability to forgive. And that does block us from receiving the forgiving mercy of God. In Mark eleven twenty five. 25. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Now you need to be able, why? God wants to forgive you. He desires to forgive you. You're never going to believe you're forgiven if you can't forgive somebody else. Then you're not going to believe it's even possible for you. So you need to get rid of that which is blocking you. How about anger? There are a lot of, we talk about poisonous emotions that are deadly to our spiritual life. It is deadly in our relationships and bitterness, resentment are two of those emotions that hurt us. Doesn't really do a whole lot to anybody else, but we can run, steal our joy. Ephesians 4, 26, as we said last week. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Work through whatever it is in your life. And, and I'll just quickly add this. Because I, when I quote this, don't take this literally. It doesn't mean you have to deal with it right then before you go to sleep. It means in a timely manner. There are some things you don't need to talk about with the other person until you calm down. My son told me about just, he called me a couple of days ago because he's up for promotion. Um, but anyway, he told me about this fight he had with Lucy, his four-year-old daughter. She would not get ready to go to school. It's preschool. I mean, she was angry. She was mad. He said it went on, probably felt like forever, an hour. And finally... Finally, he said, Lucy, I think I need a timeout. I need to calm down a little. Lucy, do you think you need a timeout? And Lucy went, Lucy needs a timeout. She went to her room, and she stayed in there, and Will went to his room. 
She stayed in there, he said, about 10 or 15 minutes and came out and said, okay, I'm ready to go to school now. Sometimes, and they tell you, do not have a conversation while you're angry. You, and you know why? Because we've all done it. Okay, maybe just me. But what happens? You say things you wish you had never said and things you can't take back. And maybe you didn't really mean it, but it's in the brain of the other person forever. So take a time out. Take a breather. Another one is busyness. Uh, And I'm trying to think it's Rick Warren who makes this comment. God can use any vessel. He can use smart vessels. He can use not so smart vessels. He can use tall people. He can use short people. He can use rich people. He can use poor people. But there is one vessel God cannot use. And that's one that is already full. We can get, and this comes out of Bill Hybel's book, too, too busy not to pray. But if you have too many things going on, you need to get rid of something. You need to decide what is really important. And if it's ruining your relationship with God and other people, you have too many things happening. Uh, James 4, 2. You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. What it's saying is you're trying to rush around, get this, get that, get the other, because you think you just have to add them without pausing long enough to ask God, do you really need it? Is this what you, is this your heart's desire? Do you need to change the desires of your heart? You don't pause long enough to talk to God. Selfishness, and I mentioned this before, I think that is why it's listed as the number one wrong request James 4 3 when you ask you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures again you can ask whatever you want but God looks at the heart and he wants you to look at your heart what is the motive is it purely selfish just because you want it when you want it how you want it or is it unselfish and doubt, James 1, 6. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Now, this is not a name it and claim it passage of Scripture. You just pray for it, and you believe it's going to happen, and if you don't believe it's going to happen, then it's not going to happen. That's not what he's saying. Do not doubt that God hears your prayer. God does indeed hear your prayer. And yes, God will answer that prayer. But remember, God doesn't always say yes to your prayers. It is not a magic incantation that we have. And some people think if I just learn the right form in prayer, if I just say in Jesus' name, if it is your will, if I just do the right things, then God is going to give me whatever I ask for. It doesn't work that way. He says no, he says wait. He says there are things that you need to take care of in your life first. What this means is don't doubt that God hears you. God does hear you and God will respond. But you have to be open and receptive to that which he has to say. More than anything else, God is concerned, as I said last week, about character development. He wants us to become the person He wants you to be. And I had this graphic up a couple of weeks ago. Didn't read it, so I'll just leave it up there this time. Life is God's gift to you. What we do with it is our gift to God. There is a, Charles Allen wrote a book on prayer called All Things Are Possible Through Prayer. And this is how he begins the book. He says, I know a man who puts his keys into one of his shoes each night when he goes to bed. The next morning when he dresses to begin a new day, that shoe is the last thing he puts on. He takes out one of the keys, holds them in his hand, and he says something like this, Lord, this day I will come to certain doors that are locked, 
but I shall use these keys to open those doors. And may I remember this day that there is a key to every situation, a solution to every problem. May I never surrender to one of life's locked doors. Instead, may I use the keys on this key ring of prayer until I find the right key and the door is opened. And then Alan says, I am one who believes that with God, nothing is hopeless, that all things are possible through prayer. But remember the parameters that I shared with you before. And at the very end of the book, he makes this comment. This is the very end of a whole book. He has written on prayer. He says, I don't understand prayer any more than I understand how electricity works. He said, I don't know how you can just, out of thin air, get electricity to light your home. But you can. And the God who gave us electricity also gives us prayer to light our lives. And He does. He comes to us and when we pray, sometimes He says yes. Sometimes He says no. Many times He says wait. But more than anything else, through prayer, God wants us to grow. Let us pray. Loving God, we are grateful that we're able to come to you right here, right now, to lift our lives, our hopes, our dreams, our sadness, our pain, to lift it all to you. And that not only do you hear us, that you will touch us, bless us, guide us into the solution, into the answer, into the opening of the door that once was closed to give clarity but we know it may not come immediately. It may not come today or tomorrow or the next, but it will come. Give us the patience to wait for your answer and then the faith to follow through. This is our prayer lifted through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'm going to invite you to affirm your faith with me by reading in unison Philippians 4, 4 through 8. Would you stand as we affirm our faith together? Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Lord. I do invite you as you go through this week to lift your lives constantly to God in prayer and then to kind of be as open and receptive as you can to what God is trying to communicate to you. 
to be able to use the keys that God has given you through prayer to open up the answer that he has for you. But to be patient and to wait. And as I've said before, that answer may come through a member of your family. It may come through when you're walking the dog. It may come to you when you're driving the car. It may come to you when you're listening to Ace next Sunday. But just be patient and wait and listen. And I also extend the invitation that there's anyone here who has not surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. And if you have felt the movement of God's Spirit, if you would like to profess your faith, if you would like to unite with this congregation, if you would like to do any of those things publicly, you can do that privately. Um, you're invited to do that as we sing the first three verses of Take Time to Be Holy. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen.